If you have ever visited a house and felt the wind touch the back of your neck while nobody is around, or heard the sound of footsteps that you can't quite put a finger on, then you will understand what some believe to be a door to another world that is opened at this house. Experience the terrifying accounts of decades of horror and hauntings in today's video, The Disturbing Occurrences at Guildhall. This curious and well documented story begins with Nicholas Sophia Hamilton, the youngest daughter of Hugh Hamilton, Baron Glenally and her cousin John Power, the son and heir of Richard Power, 1st Earl of Tyrone. As children, Nicola and John were educated together by a tutor who practiced deism, a religion with the belief that the reason and observation of the natural world were sufficient to determine the existence of God. Unsure of their tutor's religious instruction, the two cousins made a pact that whoever died first should appear to the other and confirm the religion that was preferred by God. In February 1688, Nicola married Sir Tristan Beresford of Coleraine, becoming Lady Beresford. They had two daughters, but as yet did not have a son to inherit the Beresford title. In October 1693, Lady Beresford, along with her husband, went to visit her sister, Arabella, in County Down. Arabella had married Sir John McGill and they lived in Guildhall, a substantial mansion built on the banks of the River Lagan on an estate of over 3,500 acres near the town of Dromore. One night at Guildhall, Lady Beresford woke up, startled to find her cousin, John Power, now the second Earl of Tyrone, standing at the foot of her bed. Her anger at his intrusion into her bedchamber was promptly quelled by the realisation that she was, in fact, looking at a ghost. Her cousin was dead and was appearing before her to fulfil their childhood vow. Lady Beresford asked the apparition for proof that she was not dreaming and so he reached out and touched her wrist, instantly burning her flesh and withering her sinews. He then told her that their tutor's deist teachings were wrong and the revealed religion, Christianity, was the only one by which they could be saved. He then predicted that she would bear her husband a son who would marry his niece, that Lady Beresford's husband would die soon afterwards and she would remarry, and finally that she would die on her 47th birthday. The apparition then leaned on Lady Beresford's desk and as his fingers burnt the wood, he told her that he left his signature written in her diary inside. The ghost of John Power, the second Earl of Tyrone, then began to fade and disappeared silently into the night. The next morning, Lady Beresford appeared at breakfast in a traumatised state. Her husband noticed that she wore a black ribbon around her wrist, but his inquiries were met with the reply that she would never be seen without it and that she never wanted the ribbon to be mentioned again. Breakfast was then interrupted with the delivery of a letter sealed with black wax. It announced the death of John Power the previous day, the 14th of October 1693 at 4pm. He was buried under a black marble monument in the Protestant church of Carrick and Shore, County Waterford. As the months and years rolled by, one by one, the unearthly Tyrone's predictions were fulfilled. Lady Beresford gave birth to a son, Marcus, in July 1694. Her husband, Tristram, died in 1701, and she remarried in 1704. On her 47th birthday, she was prepared to meet her maker. The day, however, and indeed the following year passed without event, and as her 48th birthday approached, she decided to celebrate her escape from Lord Tyrone's deathly prophecy. On the 23rd of February 1712, some friends were invited over to her house in Dublin for a birthday celebration, including her daughter, Susanna, her son Marcus, who was then about 12 years old, and Dr King, the Archbishop of Dublin, the clergyman who had christened her and with whom she had kept in close contact. Dr King soon expressed his surprise that this was her 48th birthday. He had remembered her christening and had looked up the date of her birth in the parish records to discover that she had, 
in fact, been born in 1665 and not, as she thought, in 1664. The day was actually her 47th birthday. You have signed my death warrant, she said, and quickly requested most of her guests to leave. She retired to her room and sent for her son and daughter. Then, for the first time, she told the entire story of her pact with Lord Tyrone. The visit of his ghost to Gilhall and his predictions. She removed the black ribbon from her wrist to reveal her withered sinews, and Tyrone's fingerprints burnt into her flesh. Tearfully, she requested everybody to leave her so that she could rest and prepare. A few hours later, they returned to find Lady Beresford dead. She was buried in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. Tyrone's final prophecy came to pass on the 16th of July, 1717, when Marcus Beresford married Catherine Power, the only daughter and heir of James Power, 3rd Earl of Tyrone. There is a portrait of Lady Beresford in Holt Castle, County Dublin. On the back of the portrait is attached an unsigned and undated note stating that Lady Beresford had originally been painted with a black ribbon around her wrist, but that this had been painted over. As the story of Tyrone's ghostly visit to Guildhall spread, the house gained a reputation of being badly haunted. The estate passed into the ownership of the Earl of Clanwilliam when Theodosa McGill married Sir John Mead, Viscount Clanwilliam. John Mead was apparently a rogue who had a string of stable boys and mistresses. The story goes that he murdered one of the Guildhall servants who was favoured by one of his mistresses. When the 5th Earl of Clan William brought his bride to Guildhall in 1909, she found the ghost of Guildhall too much to bear, and so in 1910 the house was abandoned by the family. From then it stood empty, except for a few rooms in which the land steward lived. The ghost chamber, where the apparition of Lord Tyrone had appeared to Lady Beresford, was kept in its original condition, and on occasion a charge of a sixpence per head was made for admission to the curious visitor. The house was occupied by the RAF during the Second World War, and then totally abandoned. Over the years there were numerous stories of apparitions, haunting and manifestations in the vicinity of the house. In the early 1960s a team of paranormal investigators began to examine the house, and on one night the house was rigged with microphones in the hall, the cellar, the haunted room and in another large room on the top floor. The investigators waited in one room. All was quiet until 11.50pm when loud crashes in the cellar were heard and recorded followed by a roaring sound, tuds, whisperings, a cough and a humming of a tune and then the sound of heavy furniture being moved and the appalling sound of fingernails being dragged across a microphone that was mounted 3 metres up a wall. When the team went to investigate the source of the sounds all again went quiet. They found the front door, which had previously been heavily propped open, now firmly closed, and several items disturbed in the cellar. Later the sounds of footsteps on the main stairs, voices whispering, the sound of a gun, and hundreds of tuds and bangs were recorded. The team commented that they had been warned not to investigate the house and that they found evidence of occult rituals having been practiced in some of the rooms. Later it was discovered that everybody who had been present in the house that night had experienced some kind of misfortune, a car accident, a near drowning and a nervous breakdown. A fire in June 1969 left the house a burnt out shell, but reports of hauntings and curious goings on continued into the 1980s. Eventually what was left of the house was totally demolished. Today nothing survives of Gilhall except the grim record of its history. The story of Tyrone's ghostly visit to Guildhall was used by Sir Walter Scott in his poem, The Eve of St. John. He laid his left hand on an oaken stand, his right hand on her arm. The lady shrunk and fainting sunk, for the touch was fiery warm. The sable score of fingers four remain on that board impressed, and forevermore that lady wore a covering on her wrist. And that is it for today's video. Who knows what really went on at Guildhall. Unfortunately, we can't even go to visit today to tell. Thank you all so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed the video.
if you did enjoy it, hitting that like button, hitting that subscribe button helps my channel grow. I'm trying to get back into it here. Baby Evie's growing, it's getting a bit easier, I'm finding a bit more time to make these videos, so hopefully I will get more out. And as always, this is Jay from Our Legends. Good night and good luck.